So I actually want to start off with two stories. Two stories that I recently heard, and uh, I think it's very important to share them because there's a lot to learn from them, especially when it comes to the area of halacha. So there was a a rab, a rabbi in uh, Los Angeles who recently passed away. Rabbi Reichert, if anybody heard of him. And I just heard recently a story about him, and it shows you, number one, the importance of asking, if anybody ever has a question, to ask a rabbi, to ask a rav, and you'll see in the following story how important it is in the tremendous kayak that a person has when they do so. The story goes as follows. There was a lady who needed to get an operation, and, and the doctors were telling her, this is very urgent, you have to do it ASAP. But it was in the time of the, Jew, of the Jewish month that we don't do any, we try to avoid operations. So she didn't know what to do, whether or not she should go ahead with the operation or she should wait it out. So she decided to call this rabbi that we just mentioned, this rabbi, and he listened, he heard what the doctor said, he listened to her, he said, I don't feel comfortable saying yes to you taking an operation during this time of year. And, and remember, the doctors were telling her, this is uh, urgent, so to speak, but this is, um, um, time is, is of the essence. So she listened to her rabbi, to her rav, and she did not go ahead with it. And guess what? With time, the problem actually disappeared on its own. And if she would have taken the surgery, it would have made it much worse for her. But whatever happened, it, it just simply healed on its own. So this is a, a tremendous lesson that we can learn that when it comes to all areas of our life, that the true guiding light in every action that we do is not always necessarily what we think. We always have to remember that we have to look in Taira to see what the proper guidance is. Now, it's not Shalom saying to push off any medical procedures. It just happens to me, this, the story was with this, but in, in Taira, it's very important to listen to the doctors, whatever the doctors tell you, this is ut, of ut, utmost importance. It's just a tremendous story, you know, that a person had a muna and belief in Hashem that this is the right thing to do. And look what happened, it was tremendous. And another story that I heard on Sunday, I was out of town, that's why I didn't come. I wasn't able to make it yesterday. Um, somebody shared me the story that they heard from their grandmother, that there was a couple that they were, they were married and they were not able to conceive. They were having a hard time having children. And they wrote into the Rebbe what to do. And the Rebbe wrote back to them that they have to improve in a certain area in Halakha. Make it more straight. To, to, yeah, to, to improve, Correct. exactly, to improve their conduct in a certain area in Halakha. The Rebbe wrote to them what it was. Yeah. Now, they knew right away what the Rebbe was referring to. What happened? They felt that in their situation, they can have a certain leniency. So they went ahead without asking a question to the rabbi, to the, to the rav, and they went ahead to take this leniency on their own. And as soon as the rabbi wrote to them to improve in this area, they knew right away it's because of that. So what happened? This is a tremendous story. They called the rav, they explained what happened, and the rav told them, yes, you can have this leniency. Meaning, yes, you can continue doing what you're doing, and I'm giving you a psaq halacha that you can continue doing this. And shortly after, they conceived. 
What? And shortly after they they had she was expecting and they had a baby. Only because he approved. Oh, what happened? Ah, because it's because they gave the psak. That it's okay. That it's okay. What they did. Exactly. Even that they even though they were doing it exactly. They did. I heard it. You heard the story? Before? Yeah. Look at that! Wow. So even though what they were doing was not wrong, and so. you know they didn't make a mistake on their own. They they looked it up, and they felt that this is the right thing to do in their situation. But when they ask and they got a psak, a psak gives you a special koyach, it gives you a special power, so to speak, from Shemayim, that this is the right thing to do. Um, so once they had that, and it was with a stamp, so to speak, that this is the right thing, the right way to go ahead, that was the, the vessel for their bracha, for the blessing, and, and they, they had a child. Because a rap is can, he can, he's uh, decided. Yeah, it says it's like official decision. Exactly, exactly. That's right. So in Shemayim, oh. there's a there's a Gemara in the Talmud Yerushalmi. There's a pasuk that says that Kel Gamer Alai that when a Bezdin makes a psak, that Mina Shemayim, this is it creates the reality. Yeah. And so much so that there's a certain question in Halacha that even if the Mitzvah so the, the reality was a little bit different when the Bezdin gave a psak. It actually has the kayak to change the reality. Even if he is wrong. Even if he's wrong. Meaning, well, it depends. Not so simple. If he's wrong, it can happen, but it depends. It depends on what kind of mistake it is. It's a very good question. If it's if it's a mistake in something in Allah, which is clearly written, then obviously not. But if it was oh, but if he was in a but if it was right in Allah, but it could be that the Mitsias, the Mitsios. What was going on was a little bit different. So it has such a, a koach that it can actually change the material. It can create it the way it's supposed to be. So I just felt that it's very important. We're learning halacha, so we should know the importance that every small action that we do carries a lot of weight. It's very important, you know, if there's a question, to either to look it up, to ask a question, not to be shy, because we see our small actions have a very strong impact. So, Last week, we started and finished a very short chapter, 13, Simon Yud Gimel, the halachis of Kedoshas Beis HaKnesis, Beis HaMadrash. So we're just going to review it quickly outside. It's very short. And uh, we'll continue, we'll catch up to where we were last week, and we'll continue Beis Hashem. So we know that the Kedoshah, the holiness of a Beis HaKnesis, what's a Beis HaKnesis? Anyone remember? Ashul. Back in the day, there was two buildings, separate buildings, a base of Knesset, a place where you went to Davin to pray, and a base of Medrash, a place where you went to learn. They did not connect. One place was only for Davening, one place was only for learning. Today, any shul, you have both. So today it's a little bit different. So over here, the fact that it's dividing it is because in those times, it was actually, there was a difference. So the holiness, the Kedusha, the Beis HaKnesses, and the Beis HaMedrash is it's tremendous. And therefore, there is a mitzvah to fear the one who dwells in these places. What does that mean? It means that just like Hashem dwells in the Beis HaMikdash, a shul, a Beis HaKnesses, a Beis HaMedrash, a shul where you dive in, a place, a Beis HaMedrash, a study hall where you learn, Hashem dwells there too because it's called a Mikdash Ma'at. It's called a miniature Beis HaMikdash, so to speak. So Hashem's presence is there, the Shekhinah is there. Therefore, there's a mitzvah, a special mitzvah, extra year of Hashem in this place, right? Anywhere, anywhere you go, one of them, there's the mitzvahs to media, it's the constant mitzvahs that a Jew has to keep. So you always have to fear Hashem. But when it comes to going into a holy place, it's even more, because this is where Hashem's presence is felt. Um, like the Pasuk teaches us, like it says, and for my Migdash, for my holy place, the Beis Migdash, you shall have fear. And we know that a, a Shul and a Beis Medrash are called the Migdash Ma'at. Okay. So what does it mean to have extra respect, extra awe of Hashem? This means when a person and a Yid is in Shul, they should not speak Dvarim B'Telem. Anyone knows what that is? Not even stay out to even just idle talk, you know, like uh, how are you? 
No, how are you? So it's, you know, what's going on in the news? What's, uh, what, 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 what's the latest stuff that you found online? Uh, things that they don't have any, any exactly. I, I don't work, you know, I don't talk. Things which are empty. Batalum literally means, how do you say Batalum in English? It's, it's null. It's nullified. There's nothing, there's no st substance to it. So when it comes like what? news, news, you can have people fighting about it and there's really no, their day-to-day -day life is going to be the exact same, exact same thing. They just have time to waste and instead of speaking words of title, they waste it on that. That's one example. Another example, whatever, well, there's plenty of examples. It's not so hard to, to find. I have a question. Yeah. But people sometimes stay there uh, all day, right, like here. So, so, oh, so that's different. Oh, very good question. So, what about here? We'll see in a second. It, it speaks about the, the people who sit in the show all day. Well, we'll see. That's a very good question. Um, also, one cannot keep, make their cheshbanot. How do you say that in English? Their, that literally means calculations, but calculations are, let's say, their bills, their whatever it is, their income, whatever, if they want to make a purchase, you know, a shul, a base of a study hall is not, not the right place to make those calculations. However, if they're calculations for the purpose of a mitzvah, it is allowed. For example, for tzedakah, if they're running a shul or they're running any other, a mice in the Chaban house, whatever it is, and they're making calculations for the purpose of the upkeep of a shul, that's for sure a mitzvah. Or if it's for a school that teaches Torah, that's also a mitzvah. So all of these things, there's no problem because it's not for their own purpose, rather it's for the purpose of a mitzvah. So that is appropriate and that is okay to speak in the shul. And we, we're, we show extra COVID to make sure that they're clean. As, as I mentioned last week, I think, that if there's anything on the floor in 770, the rabbi himself numerous times went to pick it up. When in the show, I know that unfortunately the reality is people are sometimes not so careful about it, that they have garbage on the floor in the show, but this is wrong. And it's a big myth, but if anybody sees any garbage on the floor, to go and pick it up. And it's not an embarrassing thing to lower yourself to pick up other people's garbage because you're doing a big mitzvah of showing respect to Hashem. So there's nothing to be embarrassed about. The Rebbe himself did it. In the right? Even, even more, I think the Rebbe went out of his way to actually pick up garbage. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, we make sure that there's always nerat, there's always lights lit in the show. There's actually a custom to have something called a ner tamid, a ner, a light, which is always lit. The custom is to have it by the, the, the Arn Kaidish, by the Holy Ark. So we see this is a, a mitzvah of COVID. That's how we have it there, of, uh, of respect and honor to, to Hashem and Shul. One should not kiss uh, the young children in Shul. Again, if it's only for the purpose of just showing love to, to his children, so there's nothing wrong with showing love to your children, obviously. However, it's not appropriate to do it in a Shul. But again, if a child is crying, if, if they need the extra care, that's not a problem. And why, what's the issue with uh, giving a child a kiss and show? The reason is because it's a place where Hashem is dwelling. <coughs> so it's not appropriate to show our attention in the way of love to anything else except for Hashem. So what, before somebody goes into the show, they should clean their feet if there's any dirt before they go in. And they should make sure that there's no dirt on their clothing. They should come in dressed respectfully in a shul. I, I, I remember once I was in a shul and there was a certain Jew that wanted to come and he felt embarrassed to come because he was wearing shorts. It's a level. People don't, not everyone, you know, they, they felt that if you're going to a shul, just like you're not going to have a meeting with your boss, an official meeting, you know, very formal, you're not going to meet a government official, you're not going to be the president, the prime minister, whichever country it is. You're not going to go in shorts. You're going to come dressed respectfully. So I remember there was a certain Jew 
He was embarrassed to come in because he wasn't dressed properly. So it's a level. Um, you are allowed to spit in a show. Our minog, our custom is to spit by Eleno. So you'll see people spitting. That's not a problem. As long as one um, with the foot, they, they smudge it with the foot, that's fine. And one cannot use the shul, let's say it's very hot outside, and you know that this shul has good AC, right? Mm. Can't use the shul uh, for, for air conditioning. If it's raining and you don't have your umbrella, you can't go into the shul for the sole, sole purpose of, um, you know, avoiding the rain. The reason is, again, you know, a shul is not a, a playground, a shul is not a store. A shul is something which is holy, which is designated for the Eidishtah, for Hashem, and it shouldn't be used for anything else. Now, what happens if you have to call your friend who's, who's in the shul? And the truth is the same thing if, if it's very hot outside or if it's raining. So what you can do is when you go into the shul, you shouldn't just go to use it for your own benefit, rather, you should say some psukim, um, some uh, verses, you should learn a little bit, you should at least hear others learning. And the bare minimum is just to sit in the shul for a few moments. Because we know that sitting in the shul, that itself is a mitzvah. Like the Pasuk says, Ashre yeshre veisecha, fortunate are those who sit in your house, which is referring to the Beis Migdosh and Batuk Nesis and Batu Midrashis. So we do see that the very fact that we sit that's a mitzvah. So again, if somebody needs to call their friend or they need any other business in the show, which is not necessarily related to a mitzvah, the answer is you go to shul and you do perform a mitzvah, then you are allowed to use it for anything else that you needed. One may not eat or drink or sleep in the shul, even a, a short nap, a power nap. However, if it's for the purpose of a mitzvah, and many have the custom to sleep in Yom Kippur and Shul, this is allowed. However, it shouldn't be too close to the Aron Kodesh, the, the Holy Ark. Also, when is eating allowed in a Shul? If it's for the purpose of a mitzvah. If it's, so let's say somebody finished a whole tractate in their learning, then uh, you're allowed to make a su'udah's mitzvah, a, a su'uda, a meal, to celebrate your accomplishment in learning. Can we do again? Can yes, yeah. Yes, sure. Yeah. yeah. Now, which one? Is right? Oh, so yeah, very good. So Fabrengan is so according to what you're saying, you're right. You should not be able to eat it by Fabrengan. So And that's a very good question. The answer is like this. So the reality is when they build a show beforehand, they make a tonight, they make a condition that the show is not just a show, but you can also do other things in it. So if this condition was made beforehand, it could help that you are allowed to. And uh, people who learn the kviyut, they learn a whole day. This was your question. You're allowed to eat. You're allowed to drink and you're allowed to sleep as long for the purpose that it shouldn't be, you shouldn't lose your ability to learn. So somebody who's full-time learning in the base medrash, it's much more lenient for them. So that's the answer to your question. And the last halacha is when you build a shul, before doing anything, it's important to ask a question to the rabbi to make sure that it's being done right because it has to be done. The Arkadish has to be in the east by Mizrach. There's, there are halachas of how many windows a shul should have, so on and so forth. And the chitza, proper the chitza, there are many halachas, so you shouldn't do it on your own in case you're you going to build a, a shul. Okay, the 14th chapter, Perik Yudalid, Simon Yudalid, the Dine Psukit is in the halachas of Psukit is in what was the page again? 92. 92. So we, we did it. Yeah, yeah, we did it. We didn't finish, so we're just going to do a quick review. So, from Haido in there, don't have to sit there. In our okay. Nusach, oh, thank you. Yeah, in our, okay. no, that's no, okay. Thank you. In, in our Nusach, we start from Haido Lashem, from 
to offer praise to Hashem, and then we recite the blessing of Baruch Sha'amar. Now, from the time when we start reciting the blessing of Baruch Sha'amar, we don't speak until we finish davening, right? Also, this includes we don't make an interruption uh, from that point and on. When we start Baruch Sha'amar, we can't speak and we can't make interruptions. What does it mean to make an interruption? So you are allowed to answer Amin to a bracha that you hear. Somebody makes a bracha, either it's in the chazan is reciting blessings or you hear another blessing recited by somebody else. One is allowed to answer Amin. Baruch Baruch Shemai is not answered from in Pesukah de Zimra. Anyone remember which parts of Kandash you're allowed to answer? Five. Oh, very good. The first five Amins. This includes Amen Yehei Shmei So you count up to five. That's as much as you can answer. Okay, Gimel, the third halacha. Let's read it inside. So it's important while we're davening to make sure that our hands are clean, right? Because you're talking to Hashem, and therefore one should not touch places in the body which are usually concealed. This includes their head. Um, from, and, and for not married also, it, it's referring to the scalp, meaning your hair is okay, but one shouldn't touch the scalp. This includes the shoes, um, scratching your back is also shouldn't be done during davening because it's a, it's a place which is covered. So anything which is covered should not be touched during davening to keep our hands clean. Also, one should not touch the inside of their nose or their ear during davening. If one needs to, they should use, here it literally means a handkerchief, but today everyone uses tissues. So they shouldn't touch directly, they should use something else to keep their hands clean. Oh, very good. If even not the other, oh, what happens if by mistake somebody did touch? They should wash their hands with water. If one is in the middle of, let's say, Shemena Esrei, or any other place that they can't just pick up and go to get water, and they can't ask anybody else for water, then, then you go like this. You clean your hand on the wall, on the, on the desk, the full hand. That's what you should do. Just like that, the whole hand, beginning top to bottom, and that's called, that's good enough. Dalit, the fourth halacha, Mizma l'sayda emrim ba'amida u'v'simcha. And we know that after we recite the blessing of Baruch Sha'amar, there's a little paragraph over there, it's called Mizma l'sayda, Mizma l'tada. So it said ba'amida u'v'simcha, it said standing, and it said with happiness. Why? Shahu b'mokim carbon taida. It's in place of a carbon that one gives as thanks to Hashem. So instead of bringing a carbon, which we're not we're not able to today because we don't have the base migdash, so we say this this uh, chapter of Tehillim that is in the place of a carbon taida of, of giving praise and thanks to Hashem, and therefore. It should be said, standing with extra respect, with simcha, it should be said with happiness that you're offering praise to Hashem. Mechein, also likewise, min vayivarech David, from the part where it says vayivarech David, ad ata hu Hashem lehalakim yemer ba'amidah. It's okay if not everyone remembers vayivarech David, because in all the sedurim, especially the annotated ones, it says stand here. From here until there, you should say, you should say it's standing. So. It's okay. You'll, if you read the instructions in the Siddur, even if you don't know where Vayivarech David is, you'll, Baruch Hashem, you won't go wrong because today's Siddurim are excellent. All the instructions are there. Vechein Hashira, when we say the Az Yashir, it should be said, Yemer Ba'amida, Ube Kavana, Ube Simcha, it should be said with concentration and with happiness. Vechein, also likewise, Bidrechas Yishtabach Ya'amud. Also, when it comes to Yishtabach, the last blessing after Pesukah Zimra, 
it is said standing. Now, again, this is all printed in the Siddur. It tells you exactly where you can stand, where you can sit. So most of the times you can't go wrong. Yes. It's from Baruch Hashem Lola Amen and after and after Ishtabach. Yes, exactly. And and also before we stand by Mizmor Lola after Baruch Shamar. Baruch Shamar and Mizmor Lola. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, B'Shamas V'Yam to the Ein Emre Mizmor Lola the chapter that we just mentioned, the thanks, giving thanks to Hashem. This is not recited on Shabbos nor on Yom Tov. Why? When it comes to bringing this um, this uh, sacrifice, this carbon, it was brought as a it's not an obligation, rather it's brought as a Nadava, somebody who wants to go ahead and offer thanks to Hashem. The Ein Mivi and the Nadarim and the Dav is B'Shamas of the Yom Tov. And on Shabbos, these types of uh, sacrifices are not brought. Gam in Emre Mesa B'Cholamayet Pesach B'Pneisha Ein Karben Teda Ba Oz B'Fisha Ima Teda Tzrich Mal Havi As Ya Asar 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 Lach Mi Chometz. Also Cholamayet Pesach, we don't say Mizmo Teda because the Karben Teda we don't bring on Pesach because part of bringing it there's a sada lachme chametz. There's ten pieces of chametz that are brought along with it. What yeah. was it? What do you mean? The korban teda. What do you mean? What was it? It's, it means that we don't bring it because uh, we need to bring with it a sada lachme chametz. Correct. What is the thing? So if somebody brought a korban, the korban teda. So together with the Korban Tada, they would also offer 10 Lachnei Chametz. So together with the Korban, the Korban, and, and exactly, yes, yeah, two separate things. So being that on Pesach, of course, you can't, right? It's Chametz. So therefore, um, on Pesach, it is not recited, not even Chalamayit, the intermediary days. Also, the out of Pesach, not the day before Pesach. Why? At a Pesach, we know we burn the chametz, right? The chametz. So therefore, the korban toda, korban seda, we know that it comes with chametz. So we're worried that one is not going to finish it up until the time that chametz is no longer allowed. So therefore, also on at a Pesach, the korban toda is not brought, and therefore we do not say mizmer. Also, not an Arab Yom Kippur, you know, because you don't have so much time to finish eating it, because already from the night of Yom Kippur, you're not allowed to eat. So regularly, you would have the entire night after some karbanis you have the next day, whatever it is. And therefore, if you brought the carbon and you didn't eat it, it disqualifies the, the, the sacrifice. So therefore, there's, as we said, the Mizmah Lasayda, this is the small paragraph right after Baruch Sha'amar, it is said standing. Shabbos and Yom Tov, it is not recited because we don't bring the sacrifice then. Cholom, the entire Pesach, it's not said because on Pesach we don't bring the, the sacrifice. Out of Pesach, it's also not said because the sacrifice isn't brought because there's not enough time. And so too by Erev Yom Kippur, we do not say Mizma Lasaida, which is the little paragraph after Barak Sha'amar. Vav. The sixth halacha. So this is a little bit different. What happens if somebody comes late to Shul and they see the Tsibur, the, the Minyan? The people davening are already holding much later. So over here, it's brought that you skip a few parts of davening in order to daven with a minion. Now, for a lady, it's not important that as important to daven with a minion as for a man. So the main thing is, if she's able to, she should daven. So it's not as important to actually catch up with the minion. So we'll leave these halakhas on the side.
So next chapter, chapter 15, Panic Love. I have a question. Sure. Yeah. So if we come and they are late and, and we are late. Yeah. So we we can we still need to yeah, you have on, on your pace. But you you hear sometimes um, okay, so you are just and so when you need to... a man that exactly. oh exactly but you need to stand and you need to do uh with with them or not? Um you answer, just answer. And you need to listen about the shots. No, no, you just you just listen and say amen when you have to, and you're done on your own pace. Yeah, that's it. So this is a very, very good question. This actually brings these halachas to practicality. Why? Somebody comes late to show, and let's say the minyan, the minyan is up to Khazar's shots, the repetition of the amida. And you just finished Baruch Sha'ama, let's say, but you can't talk. So what's the halacha? Can you answer amen to the to the blessings of of the repetition of the amida or not? Oh, that's for kaddish. Ah, yeah, very good for kaddish. For what? what about for the repetition? The chazar yes. shats. You do. You do answer amen too. So you came late to shul. You started saying baruch shalomar. You said the blessing. You can't talk anymore. Now the chazan, the chazan is up to the repetition of the amida. So what can you answer to? So as we mentioned, you don't say Baruch Hu Shemai. All you answer to is Amen, and that's it. So this is a very good implication of this halacha. So you're holding the place where you can't talk. The, the minion is already up to the repetition of the Amida. So the Chazan is saying all the blessings. So you do answer Amen, but you do not say Baruch Hu Shemai. Very good. This is a very good application. Of this Allah, this law. Okay, Tazvav, Simon Tazvav, the 15th chapter, the halachas of Kaddish and Baruch, and how do you count a minion? So, we're not going to learn the halachas of how a minion is composed of, but the most important thing is the laws of Kaddish and Baruch. That's what we're going to focus on over here. Aleph. So we started with Haidu. You said Baruch Sha'amar. You said the whole Psukh de Zimra. You finished Yishtabach. This is where we're holding to in our davening. After Yishtabach, does anybody know what happens? What does the Chazan say? Anyone know? What does the Chazan say after Yishtabach? Kaddish? Exactly. Achi Yishtabach in Ashatz Chatzi Kaddish. After the blessing of Ishtabach, the Chatzah recites the Kaddish, the Chatzah Kaddish. Why are there so many Kaddish? It's good. More on that. It's more of a mitzvah. Uh, that's why? Right. Sure. It's actually, it's brought down that it's more important to answer Amen to Kaddish more than uh, Kedushah of Chazar Tashaz. It's more, really? yes, yeah, that's what's brought down. So after the blessing of Yishtabach, the the the, Tzibur, the, the Chazin recites Chatzik Kaddish, just the first five parts of Kaddish. Ein Emrim Kaddish, Baruch Kedusha, and Kedem Batele Ella Basara Anash Gedelim. So all of these things are only said with a minion. What's a minion? You have to have ten men who are over bar mitzvah. If they're little kids, just because. The men that doesn't count for a minion, they have to be over by mitzvah. This is a very important halacha. Let's say you're diving in either in a shul or in a chabad house where it's very, the minion is very tight. Every day, you don't always get your minion on time. And by Yishtabach, you finally get your minion. And, so, and by Yishtabach, you find right before Baruch, you finally get your 10 people. So if the Chazan gets 10 people before you said Yishtabach, so everything is fine. He continues as normal. But let's say the Chazan said Yishtabach, and then the 10th person came in. Yeah, you don't say Kaddish. Yeah, exactly. It happens all the time. So it's important to know if the Chazan already said Yishtabach, you don't say Kaddish, if there's not a, a minion at the time. 
So only the next one is okay. Exactly, the next one after with the minion. Vlachain, therefore, Yamtinu Malema Yishtamach. One should wait from saying Yishtamach and Shiyavayu Asada until ten people come. We are Chaylon, Lahamton, and Karim Lachatsi Shayu, able to wait up to close to half an hour. So you're not to sit, sit around that long. The Yesu Lo Yamtinu. More than that, one should not wait. Allah Yemenu Yishtamach Yamtinu. They should say, the blessing of Ishtamach and then wait. So if the Chazan already said Ishtamach and he didn't have the minion, then the minion came afterwards, so you can't say Kaddish just yet. So you should say a few verses with a minion and then you can say your Kaddish and then move on. Base. What is considered, as we just said, that it has to be 10 men who are grown, G'daylem, that's the Lashen in the, in the Kitzvah Shachan Aruch. So G'daylem, one who is big, Ha'inu she'avru lo'i shleisha esr, shana v'nichlas l'shnas v'dalet. One who is already 13, so it's not, we know for, for Tehillim, our capital, let's say if somebody's 15, but for the capital Tehillim, they say the 16th capital, because they entered already the 16th year. When it comes to counting somebody for a minion, it's not going by which capital you say, it's going by actually reaching that age. So taking a young <coughs> boy who was 12 years old does not help you for a minion, just because he's saying the 13th chapter of Tehillim, but they actually have to be a full 13 years old. Kagai, for example, yeah. So how do some people get the leniency where if you only if you have nine men, you can use one kid who's about like 10 to 12 of learning age? To her to hold a chumash. To hold a chumash and then they can count. So I know my shows had to do that a few times. Oh, very good. But so I guess where's the leniency come from? There is the, 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 it is a valid leniency. And it's actually brought down to Aruch, such an opinion. But if you have nine who are 100 percent bar mitzvah, <clears throat> so there is a minority opinion where you can give a child, a young child from the eight, as you mentioned, that age, to give them a chumash, and there you have a minion. Of course, if it's possible not to use it, you shouldn't use it, but, you know, in the case in the community where it's very hard to get 10, then there are those who rely on it, and there is what to rely on. So, but it's just one. Yeah. So over here, we're talking about in general, it should be everyone over 13. If so, that we're not even going into that opinion, we're going by general how it should be. But the, this opinion does exist, this is true. So, Kagain, how do you count? Um, how do you count somebody who's 13? For example, they were born in Rishchedish Nisim. We don't become bar mitzvah until they reach Rishchedish Nisim, which is their birthday. The Hainu, and when do you count from the birthday? Because we know in Halacha you count from the night before. The Hainu, but Chilla Salala Shalom Rishchedish Nisim, La Acher Yid Gimel Shanim, Nasa Gadol. So somebody, we know that in, in Yiddishkeit many things we count from the night before. So when it comes to somebody's birthday, it's the same principle. If it already reached that night, of one's birthday, it's your birthday, you reach this age, you are now the next uh, a year older, so to speak. Now, this year, does anybody know, is it a uh, two others, one other, two? What happens if somebody is born in the first other and it's a, a leap year? There's two others, when do they celebrate the birthday? Does anyone know? You saw the second one. So we'll see inside. Me Shanel and Bechedesh Adar, Keshehai Sashan of Shoto, or somebody was born in a regular year. A Shan of Shoto, it's called. It's not a leap year, it only has one Adar. Ochshanasa Gadol has Shana Mubedes. And when the year that they become Bar Mitzvah, it's a leap year. There's two. Others. 
Even though they were born in a year where there's only one Adar, however, when it comes to a year where there's two Adars, you have to wait until the second one. You have to wait a whole extra month for your birthday. What happens if no, they were actually born in a leap year in the first month of Adar? That's a Godel Gam came by the Rishon. So they actually do become a Godel. They, their birthday is counted from the first Adar. The Im Kishinei Lod Haiser Shanamu Badis. However, let's say it was a leap year and uh, they were born in the second month of Adar. Kishinei Lod Haiser Shanamu Badis. 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 Kishinei Lod So we have a bunch of cases over here. So again, somebody was born in a regular year in Adar. The year that they turned bar mitzvah, this is all about how to count for a minion. The year that they turned bar mitzvah, that year happens to have two Adars, just like this year. So they only are considered bar mitzvah from the second Adar. So they have to wait an extra month. If they were born in a year where there's two Adars regardless, and they were born in the first Adar, you go by the first Adar. Now, let's say the opposite. Let's say they were born in leap year, in the second Adar, and the year that they become Bar Mitzvah, it's a regular year, so then you're counted by the regular Adar. So let's say somebody's born in the fifth of Adar, or the second Adar. And the year they become Bar Mitzvah, there's only one Adar, you count the fifth of Adar regularly. You don't have to wait until the next month. You go by that Adar, and that's it. Benimsa, Here's a very interesting. What, what, when is it? This year. This year. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's very interesting. We're saying like this. Somebody was born the 20th of the first Adar. And their friend was born on the 10th of the second Adar. So who's older? Who was born first? So everything, everything is changed? Yeah, sometimes you have different, you can have a change. So again, somebody was born on the 20th day of the first Adar, and their friend was born in the same year as them on the 10th of the second Adar. Who's older? The first Adar, right? Because he was born on the 20th of the first month. His friend was born on the 10th of the second month. So he's older by 20 days, give or take. What happens? According to what we said, it's going to come out that his friend who was born later is going to be older than the one who was born earlier. Why? Because when it's going to come a regular year, the one who has his birthday on the second Adar celebrates his birthday on the uh, before on the tenth of Adar, and the friend who was born on the twentieth of this of the, the first Adar is going to go on the twentieth twentieth of Adar. So he's going to be born. His birthday is going to be 10 days before his friends, even though he's born after. So it's uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, and that's, and then that's actually how we calculate for, for uh, to count somebody for bar mitzvah. Oh, wow. To count somebody for bar mitzvah, this is the, the, the way to calculate it. Okay, Mitzvah Shem, we'll continue Thursday, Mitzvah Shem, yeah. <laughs> Bye.